Hello, everyone. My name is Scott Sorrell, and I'll be your moderator today. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the next installment of Baltimore's Real Science Lecture Series. Today's Real Science webinar will look into the crystal ball to see what the future might hold. Dr. David Cole, Professor Emeritus from Virginia Tech, will share his presentation titled Transitioning a Black Swan into a Phoenix in the Global Dairy Industry. I would now like to introduce Dr. David Cole. Dr. Cole received his MS and PhD degrees in Agricultural Economics from Cornell University. He is Professor Emerita of Agricultural Finance and Small Business Management and Entrepreneurship in the Department of Agriculture and Applied Economics at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, Virginia. Dr. Cole is an academic Hall of Famer in the College of Agriculture at Virginia Tech. He has keen insight into agriculture industry gained through extensive travel, research, and involvement in ag businesses. He has traveled nearly 10 million miles, conducted more than 6,500 presentations, and published more than 2,250 articles during his career. He is currently president of AgriVisions LLC, a knowledge-based consulting business providing cutting-edge programs to leading agricultural organizations worldwide. Dr. Cole is also a business coach and part-time owner of Homestead Creamery, a value-added dairy business in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Dr. Cole, the floor is now yours. And it's a pleasure to be here with you, uh, talking about transforming a black swan uh, to a phoenix in the global dairy industry. Live from Blacksburg, Virginia, this morning we're getting uh, snow flurries, snow showers. And uh, so it's good morning to uh, kind of look at uh, the big picture. I've got uh, uh, three objectives here today. I'd like to go up about 30,000 foot and look at and examine some of the big picture trends uh, that are going to be impacting the dairy industry or the agriculture industry in general. And then second, I would like to talk a little bit about the management mindset, which is going to be so critical regardless of what your responsibilities in working with the agriculture industry will be. And then, of course, as Scott mentioned, uh, we'll engage some questions toward the end of the talk. So let's jump right in and talk about transforming this black swan to a phoenix. I've been shut down since uh, about mid-March. Typically, I'll travel about 250,000 air miles a year, and maybe 75,000 rental car miles a year. However, we've done over 120 webcasts like this and Zoomcasts, and I've actually uh, been able to do things that I've never done before. But here are some views from Cyberville for 2020 and beyond. First of all, the black swan or the unusual event, you're gonna have those about every decade with two mini babies in between. And what am I talking about mini babies? A disease event, a weather event. And black swans, uh, this one of course is COVID-19. Uh, in 2008, 2009, it was the economic crisis uh, called the Great Recession. Around the turn of the century, it was what? The meltdown of the high-tech market followed by 9-11. And then, of course, we had the oil shocks. And, and so you can build these into a plan. But one of the things about a black swan, it'll accelerate change for the consumer, societies, and business. So we're in an accelerated change period right now. And these black swans, they're disruptors, and they are challenging, but they also create opportunities. So one of the things that you got to do is see the uh, cup half full rather than half empty. But one of the things that we're really noticing is COVID-19, the black swan, has accelerated the economic and financial divide for the decade of the 2020. So it's really gonna impact that famous bottom line. Well, speaking of a black swan, let's look at this progression. And these three slides right here were actually developed in mid-March. Uh, so I didn't jump on the bandwagon here. And I got to tell you, I've taken uh, my psychology courses. Of course, I had to uh, adjust my courses to my basketball responsibilities, uh, you know, as uh, through college and university. And one of the things is this black swan, it's going through a very, very standard type of progression. First of all, it was the dirty bird and it dumped here in the United States and in, to some extent in Europe from about you know February, March to May 1. 
And of course, we had the job loss. And one of the things is the consumer shutdown. And you know, you look at the, many of the rich nations in the world, a large part of the economy is driven by consumer based. And these folks went basically to zero or 25% of sales, your school systems, your university systems, uh, your hotels, your airlines. And so the global economy was put on life support. Matter of fact, if you look at the government stimulus checks, it's almost 13% uh, uh, of the world economy was basically a government check. And so there was shock, numbness. However, the second stage, and we could anticipate, is the angry bird. And what happened was we had disjointed uh, recovery plans nationally and globally. And of course, we're starting to realize the job loss. And one of the things it did, it accelerated deglobalization discussions and the trade issues, which were brewing, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. It basically accelerated those. And one of the things is it created volatility in extremes based off headlines. So regardless of your responsibility out here, we're going to be in a dairy industry of extreme volatility, price and cost. And of course, uh, in personal, societal, and government, we've seen revenge, pointing fingers, confusion, and frustration. But what it requires is collaboration, critical thinking. Now, here's the next stage. And, you know, I've got this stage, the Angry Bird ending December 31st. Now it'll carry over into 2021. But one of the things that I've seen the most progressive businesses do, they've taken this black swan and formed it into a phoenix, the rise of the mythical bird out of the ashes. And one of the things that you're going to see is new business models. You're going to see some consolidation, accelerated deglobalization, which is going to be critical to the dairy industry. And one of the things, artificial intelligence is going to really accelerate. And again, you're going to see accelerated innovation in health systems. Keep that in the back of your mind because one of the things is health systems are going to line up with our agricultural systems here over the next four or five years. And of course, TSA, that's basically, if you go through the airlines, it's, it's just going to be surveillance all the time. And here is your key, is to take the angry energy and turn it toward positive energy and a commitment to move forward. You have to adjust and focus. And key words are going to be creative leadership, innovation, adaptation, and you're going to see new models for success. Now, I mentioned I was going to talk about global macroeconomics. There's going to be about four or five areas that we're really going to have to watch. First of all, globalization to deglobalization. After World War II, we had decades of globalization and actually it accelerated. We had the great commodity super cycle uh, and it accelerated. 1995 to 2017, and we were actually into hyper-globalization. And it was, what, formed by the BRICS and the Kim Ts. That's Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, South Korea, Indonesia, Mexico, and Turkey. Those nations' purchasing power increased two times, while the rich nations in the world, in Europe, Japan, North America, only increased 44%. However, it started to slow down around 2009. If you remember in the dairy industry, 2009 was not a good year. And all of a sudden we started seeing the contraction of global trade down 9%. And the financial crisis set it off, but then government, business, and consumers had their agendas as well. The other thing that's going to be real interesting to examine is ISI. It's the Poor substitution into industrialization strategy. In other words, one of the Achilles heels that COVID-19 really brought about was supply and marketing chains. And one of the things that you're going to see is more of a regionalized concept worldwide. For example, China now has Made in China 2025. And of course, you have India, Europe, and the U.S., uh, and some of the other uh, areas of the world want to become more self-reliant in technology, manufacturing, but agriculture as well. And one of the things that we're really going to see is concentration versus diversification. 
And this is going uh, to be on a lot of strategic planning uh, uh, agendas. Now, moving along, you're also going to see a disjointed U.S. and global recovery. Uh, one of the things that, you know, when you're doing your planning, we're probably going to be a 90, 95 percent uh, pre-COVID type of economy. But there's going to be some of the economies are going to be 50 to 75 percent. For example, your airlines. Uh, for example, your hotels. Uh, another example would be even your school systems as we've kind of transformed. But then there's going to be other parts of the economy are going to be 125 percent. And all you have to do is look at uh, some of the uh, various businesses out here who have actually accelerated due to the COVID. Now, what's real interesting, you're going to see more and more trade agreement uncertainty. Now, let's go to Australia and, uh, I, and look at Australia. For example, the Australian scientists basically said, you know, the, the bug, COVID-19, broke out in China and was spread worldwide. Their scientists said that. Well, what happened was automatically China put some sanctions and tariffs. Matter of fact, they just put some more tariffs on uh, the wine industry coming out of Australia. And that's the precursor of some of the things that could occur. And one of the things the rich nations like in Europe, the United States, or Japan, Canada, one of the things is it's going to be interesting to watch them observe what's happening to Australia. But one of the things that I will have to tell you, let's talk about China. China's Silk and Belt Road Initiative it was started in 2013, and they've invested over a trillion dollars in 68 countries around the world loans, infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. And this is all a design plan, uh, basically, to expand their worldwide type of influence. And now their next step is going to go through medical innovation, OK, and human health. Now, here is a big one that really impacts competitiveness in agriculture worldwide. And it's basically government support for agriculture. Worldwide, it's two billion dollars a day here in the United States in 2020. So far, it's about 36 billion. It may creep toward 50 billion by the end of the year. We've got some um, industries in the United States, like our grain industry, et cetera, et cetera. 95 percent of their net farm income is basically coming from a government check. One of the things that we're going to have to really watch is how other segments of society uh, you know, examine the support and say, hey, they're getting it, we're not. Also, on a global competitiveness, which country gives up their support first? But anytime you have government writing checks, you will see government encroachment, taxes, regulation, and other. So this is a big type of risk that is out there. And many of you are nutritionists or your scientists out here these are the things that you've got to think about outside your normal everyday silo or when you're doing your strategic planning for the industry. Now, let's move on and talk about Asia. And it's very, very critical. I call it the rise of Asia. Let's go back to 1990. And if you look at China, they were about 2% of the world's GDP. Currently, it says 2020, 14%. They're actually 16%. And they took world market share basically from Europe and Japan. Now, from 2020 to 2030, it'll be from the United States and some of the other countries in the world. And China just unveiled uh, its new strategy, its 14th five-year plan. And what's real interesting is this, where global trade centered around the United States for decades, uh, now, what they want is more of a regionalization strategy, and what you will see is that China is the major player in the Asian region, which I'll talk about is going to be very, very important. The other part of China's strategy, uh, become a dominant uh, world power, economic power, is to get their consumers to consume more. Let's go here in the United States. Uh, about 70% of the U.S. economy is driven by the consumer. Uh, in China, uh, they've got about a $15 trillion economy. It's about $4.5 trillion. 
they would like to increase that 50 to 60 <clears> percent. <throat> so what you may see over the next few years is more of a regionalized type of strategy in Europe, North America, <clears throat> Asia, and of course in the Southern Hemisphere. Now, it was real interesting a few weeks ago while we were concentrating on our U.S. elections <clears throat> and uh, uh, on our sport events over the weekends, I was watching something that was really very, very critical to the future of agriculture. And it was the passage of the RCEP or the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which uh, combined its 15 Asian countries, but it also includes China. Now let's put this into perspective. It's 2.7 billion people, $25.8 trillion of about an $80 trillion world economy, but the global trade value is 12.5 trillion. Now let's contrast that to the North American USMCA. That's three countries, Canada, United States, and Mexico, about 500 million, about $24.4 trillion but only about 7.8 in global trade. Now, the CPTPP, or the Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement, that's 11 countries, 508 million people, uh, with 11 trillion, but about a global trade value of 7.6 trillion. What I'm trying to tell you is, in the next few years, a lot is going to be changing in global trade agreements. And it's going to be interesting to see if the United States then comes back into the Trans-Pacific Trade Deal as a blocking strategy to China. This was a significant, significant type of event, particularly for the dairy industry, where countries are dependent on export markets. And so this global trade perspective, it's going to be evolving and it's going to create this volatility that I talked about, but volatility also creates opportunity. Now, let's look at the grain industry here in the United States, but let's look at it abroad, because again, that's your cost part. That nutritionist does, you you know, balance some of your rations, work with your producers out there, very, very important. What we have seen recently is a runoff of soy, soybean prices and also corn. That is China rebuilding its hog sector, but also China's other strategy of stockpiling commodities. Also, one of the things that we have to examine is the economic health of trading partners uh, throughout the world. But one of the critical aspects that's going to influence the bottom line of the dairy industry is going to be weather, global weather and climate change. And again, I do a lot of programs, webcasts with Eric Snodgrass. He is a, a, a meteorologist, climatologist. And one of the things Eric says, we're going to see weather in extremes. And I totally agree. Extended dry periods with intense rainfall over short periods of time. So again, this could impact you know, some of the economics and the cost structure on many of our dairy businesses. Of course, we have to watch the value of the dollar, still dominant currency, but don't, you might want to expect the dollar could deflate as much as 15% over the next year or two. Of course, consumer trends are going to be discussed in the next webcast that's coming up, but in the United States and in Brazil, watch the stance of the ethanol industry because a lot of the corn maize crop uh, goes through ethanol, which influences uh, the price of corn. Over on the livestock side, <clears throat> I think it's access to markets and marketing changes. And again, we had this concentration and we saw what happened when the processing plants were hit by the black swan. And again, producers struggled, suffered, the consumer paid more, the processors still made out, but it left the venue for competitive products. And folks, non-meat alternatives, non-dairy alternatives were able to gain even more of a foothold in this area. And again, I like my steak, I like my ice cream, my milk, but again, this is going to be major, major competition in the future. Also, regulation and labor. Uh, one of the things is it's moving us more and more toward automation uh, in our dairy 
industry. Now, U.S. economy, everybody's asking, uh, what do I see? Uh, I see a Nike swoosh with a jagged recovery, a jagged W recovery, size 14 to size 18. And one of the things is uh, this disjointed recovery, uh, again, in the United States, watch three states, California, Texas, and Florida. Those three states are a third of the U.S. economy, fourth largest economy in the world when you put them together. And unless we have, uh, you know, some corrective action here on the health, of course, these vaccines are going to come out, but again, there's going to be some angry birds there, and then re-emerging Bioshocks or a cyber attack. These are things that could disrupt the U.S. economy, which will ripple right through out the world. So that's the big picture as far as economics. I want to just kind of give you this, a mega trend on the radar screen. I call it the production consumer paradigm. And, and, and folks, if you're tuning out on me, you better tune in here. I think the decade of the 2020s is going to be defined by soil and water health. Uh, because if you look at some of the nasty bugs, they broke out in areas of the world where what? Uh, unhealthy soil, unhealthy water. Now, one of the things that I think is very, very critical is if you have healthy soil, healthy water, you have a healthy plant, a healthy animal, healthy human being, and a healthy environment. I want you to think about that from a holistic type of standpoint. And again, you're going to uh, examine competitiveness of the dairy industry based off this this area. It's going to be one of the pillars that you're going to have to look at. We're also going to have to look at air quality. And of course, I mentioned weather and climate in extremes. And so these are going to be things that are going to kind of make you think at the 30,000 foot level. Now, moving along, are there some positives COVID-19? They sure are. The importance of a safe food, fiber, and fuel source are the basics of life. But here is one of the things, reinsurance of transparency where food is produced, where it's processed, and where it's distributed. And again, I talked about the importance of a healthy soil, healthy water. And again, every nutritionist needs to be thinking about this. We've also discovered niche markets, not only U.S., but globally. But we've had a chance to reposition the image of agriculture because Everybody was moving toward urbanization. All of a sudden, what we're starting to see is a rural renaissance as people are de-urbanizing out here. And again, this will be very important for the decade of the 20s. Now, let's go to the economics. <clears throat> I pull off the FinBin database out of the University of Minnesota uh, because it's in 22 states. Uh, thousands of farms. It's really good data. I like it better than the USDA data. I'm not knocking USDA data, but this is scrub type of data. Now, what's the point on this slide right here? From 96 to about 2006, you saw fairly uh, even incomes. In other words, not a lot of volatility, but what has been the name of the game in the past 12 years is volatility. So when you're out there working with that dairy, business or working in the dairy industry, one of the things is you can expect this extremes in volatility, which requires a high business IQ. Now, what's real interesting, if you look at this database, there's always a top 20%, bottom 20%. And one of the keys to remember is when the bottom 20% of uh, industry is starting to make money, you're going to have problems in that industry two to three years ahead of time. When milk prices spiked there in 2014, one of the things is that's probably one of the worst things that could have happened because, again, the inefficient producer kind of comes in. Now, a lot of people will say, you know, how is uh, the income out there? Well, it's real interesting. From the top 20, uh, to the low 20, you'll see the net farm income is substantially different. And with the point I'm trying to get across is, as nutritionists, as people who work with the dairy industry, who are the types of farms that are going to integrate some of your recommendations? And then how is it going to influence their bottom line? And the point I'm trying to get across is that top 20%, top 40%, 
are the ones that you really need to focus on. Uh, a lot of people say, is it based off herd size? Yes, it is. However, what we have found, if I had this other slide, it's almost a goal post. Uh, the bigger, larger dairies make more money, but okay, the larger dairies can lose more money on the low end. So herd size, yeah, you will see it steps up, but one of the things that we found is some large dairies that are mismanaged can lose and lose very fast because there's more decimal points and more commas that are out there. Now, what are some of the characteristics of the top 20 and the bottom 20? They're going to carry more debt. But they'll have this thing called high business IQ, and be patient. I'll show you what that is in a minute. But there's going to be this key word. If you're ever in an advisory group uh, with these folks, they'll have a strong working capital position. In other words, the ability to generate cash very, very quickly. But here is where you focus in. They'll be strong in production and operational efficiencies. And uh, one of the things that we'll see this time and time again and they have strong capital turnover. They know how to get the most out of their capital assets and human assets, but they also focus on bottom line margin. Contrast that to low 20%. Low 20% oftentimes are carrying uh, very little debt. They'll have high equity and they basically get very, very complacent and passive. And they'll constantly have to be refinanced uh, by their agricultural lender. And one of the things that we're finding is they're very, very dependent on the government payments, but they'll have that weak operational and production efficiency, lower liquidity, and have this lower business IQ. Now, this management mindset, let's talk about it. And I, often, I deal a lot with the banking industry. And by the way, you're in advisory uh, you know, teams. If sometimes your lenders invite you, you better listen. You better listen. Get out of your nutritionist silo. And, I, and again, I tell my lenders, get out of their lender silo. When you're dealing with production A, producer A, they will often ask these questions. How do I compare? How are others doing? Uh, they'll think long term, vice versus the producer B. Will the lender finance me? Am I going to survive another year? And then oftentimes they're the victims. They'll blame everybody else for the problems. and uh, Or you're dealing with the know-it-all. Uh, that basically uh, will not listen to you. Now, I was over at Virginia Tech guest lecturing. About 7% of our courses are face-to-face, -face, uh, you know, during COVID. And it's been fun to be here and go over and guest lecture in the senior management classes. So I told the students over there, in school, you get the lesson first, then you get the test. In real life, in real world, you get the test first, and then you get the lesson. And one of the lessons is you've got to assess management out here and who you're dealing with. I, I put them into green, yellow, or amber light, or red lights. The green lights, they're adaptive to the situation, very, very proactive. They follow the 5% rule. They try to be 5% better in a few areas of their business. They get efficient before they get bigger. Here's a quote for you. Better is better before bigger is better. And they know how to sweat the small stuff. They know how to plan, strategize, execute, and then monitor. They're very, very process-oriented, or their team is very process-oriented, and they will use advisory teams. This is one of the fastest worldwide growing trends on our green, uh, green light profitability type of farms. The yellows, they're successful because they have a history, their family businesses, lots of equity, but they'll have profitability and cash flow problems. They are inept at developing the next generation or they wait too late. They try to add more cows, get bigger before they get better, and then they don't have the human horsepower uh, to be able to carry out and execute the plan. And they're always looking for that magic bullet or that next big thing. Now, those folks, some of them you can turn around and put them up into greens. Now, the reds, they're waiting for the prices and the markets to save them. The excuse game, it's not my fault. They'll lose money, but the equity keeps them going in business. Now, remember the 80-20 rule. It's very, very simple. 80% of your business is with 20% of the people. You've got to decide which 20%.
and think about it. here's a little strategy I want you to do after this webcast is identify names that would go in greens, yellows, and reds, and this will help you prioritize your priorities. I kept talking about the business IQ, and about three years ago, uh, one of the things is management. It's a very, very difficult thing to, you know, quantify. And so we came up with a list of 15 questions that you can ask for crucial conversations, okay? And when you're working with your customers, all the way, do they know their cost of production? Do they know it by enterprise? Will they take time to write down goals? Do they do a projected cash flow? Do they do financial sensitivity analysis, price, cost, uh, uh, how markets influence? Uh, will they work with an advisory team? Uh, what's their living lifestyle? Uh, do they have a plan for improvement? And are they transitioning to the next generation? And also educational seminars and courses. And then the final ones, attitude. Now, a lot of you can relate to this. I'm in Fort Wayne, Indiana, doing a livestock crop conference. And I had uh, breakfast with an 84-year-old uh, large animal vet. Just, he was a character. A lot of you know those types of veterinarians. You work with them all the time. He's opinionated. He came to my seminar that afternoon. And he came up afterwards. He says, boy, I really enjoyed your seminar. Thank you. But he says, I'm disappointed. Well, you disappointed it. He says, your business IQ chart. And boy, I went from six foot four to uh, down in size very quickly. I says, what don't you like about it? He says, that line 15 needs to be line number one. Because as a large animal vet, when I was dealing with the reactive and the indifferent people, I was constantly out there on emergency work, two o'clock in the morning, snowstorms, et cetera, et cetera. He says occasionally it would happen on the proactive. And he said the proactive people were so much more enjoying, fulfilling to work with. Folks, this is a great tool uh, to kind of size up uh, your customer base. And if you have some of these advisory team meetings, it's a very, very good tool. This was an example of a farm we just did here, a large farm. And uh, one of the things that you will see is we had the husband, the wife, the daughter, the CFO, uh, the lender all fill it out. And basically they found the areas that they wanted to continue, but then the three areas for improvement. And remember, the the rule of three, never more than three. We call it the Babe Ruth three. He was number three uh, because if it's more than three, it'll be too overwhelming. Now, this business IQ, it's great for these advisory meetings. Uh, first of all, I will not, I, listen to me, I will not work with a business that's not willing to fill this out uh, because it'll just be a waste of my time have each family member fill it out separately and then combine it. Uh, it helps prioritize improvements. Great communication tool, internally, externally, but the customer develops a plan for improvement. It helps that buy-in, and it's a great way to measure year over year. Let's go to Nebraska. Had a young man come up to me, and he says, he showed me his original score and then his latest score, and he improved by five points. And uh, I says, well, did it improve your bottom line? Listen to this. His bottom line profits went up four times. Now, I'm not going to guarantee it's going to increase four times, but it's a great way to get people to think in the process. University of Kentucky is doing a study in their farm business record system, and they found that people that had a score up around 40, top third, they carried much less debt than the bottom third that had a score of about 32, 31. But here is really, really showed up. The top third, their scores were at business IQ scores about 39, uh, 38, 39, 40. The bottom third was about 33. You can see profits were substantially greater. And then finally, we've looked at it as far as net farm income, medium and mean. And what we found is the top third that had business IQ scores, 38, 39, versus the bottom third was 32, 33. They were, what, five times more profitable. So this business IQ 
this is an objective way to be able to measure it. And you can kind of get uh, the assessment of that customer whether they're going to you know, proceed with some of the recommendations or not. Now, four pillars of success. It's doing a worldwide webcast, 23 speakers. I was the final speaker. And they asked the speakers on this worldwide webcast to come up with the four pillars of business success. And here they are. And it could be your businesses out there as well. One, you got to be resilient. And that's knowing your cost of production, having a good marketing plan, having the capital equity. But this future of the 2020s requires us to be agile, having the working capital, quickness to cash, having a market for a product, and then it's optimization and efficiency versus diversification and resiliency. We don't want all of our eggs in one basket. The 2020s is going to be very entrepreneurial and innovative. In other words, that's finding your phoenix. Remember, the dairy business, and by the way, that video, the thing that came with the video prior to this webcast, it was a people first business. You could see it in that. And I, I the ability to invest. You, your customers investing in their people, but it's also aligning to a rapidly changing marketplace out there. And again, we COVID-19, the pandemic has just accelerated this. And then having this strong business IQ is very critical. Scores, you know, in all 15 areas, but it's the ability to plan, strategize, execute, and then monitor that plan. And I think one of the key things, advisory teams, but also having KPIs on uh, production, efficiency, finance, marketing, uh, is going to be very, very important to have these type of dashboards, regardless of where you operate a, a business in the global uh, world. Now, here's some value-added thoughts, all right, as I kind of conclude down. And get some of your questions kind of ready. Uh, remember, time is a commodity that's limited. And, and again, sometimes what happens is we get caught up uh, into too much detail. What you're trying to do is help people save time. Trust, once violated, jeopardizes the relationship. And boy, in today's world with social media, trust can be broke down and very difficult to repair. Who are you dealing with? Or who are you? Do you own it or do you make excuses? Boy, look at uh, the customer base out there. Most successful dairymen, they own it rather than just make excuses. Occasionally, there's going to be some excuses. They're innovative, forward thinking. And who is driving the business, the doer or the manager? And remember, the future of the dairy business is going to be data driven. It's going to require collaboration and a team of advisors. And one of the things, you know, we talk about customer service. I call it the A's and P's of customer service. Available, amenable, and a good attitude. But be per persistent, be patient, be polite. It's real interesting. I just got a handwritten thank you note, uh, handwritten, rather than email. Boy, that meant so much to me. And again, these are some value-added thoughts. A lot of folks were too busy to be thinking about those. Well, here are some perspectives I see in the 21st century. The 20th century was about physics and the nuclear bomb. 21st century is going to be about biology and bioshocks. Next thought, meshing bioengineering and information. You got to make the complex simple. If you can't put something on a simple napkin and explain it, we call it the bar napkin approach. Uh, again, it's 90% of your success is taking the complex and making it simple. Human health on the risk. Uh, we're going to have more high tech, but the more we go high tech, the more high touch. And believe me, in the next four or five years, we're going to see more and more of this. Remember, 50% of the world buying power is going to reside in the Asian rim by 2035, 2040. Here's a thought. The more we get sterile households, the more we're going to create uh, environments for bioshocks and increased pandemics. And it's not all bad to be out there. By the way, look at your video out there. You know, those kids are out in the dirt, out there with the animals, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things is these sterile households, uh, it, it could be a problem. 
And here's just a thought. Degrees are going to be replaced by a series of certificates and uh, what we call customized or customized lifelong learning. So I just wanted to give you those thoughts to stimulate your thinking. And let's just kind of conclude down. Black swans accelerate change and disruption, but remember, they create opportunities. Success is about attitude. Do you own it or make excuses? Execution requires what we call the hut principle. Taking time to listen and hear, but understand and understand what's not being said, but then taking action. A lot of people will not take action because they're afraid of the consequences. And you know what I often tell people? One of the things is if you don't take action, there is consequences as well. Your network of people will be equal to your self-worth first and your financial net worth. While I was lecturing over at Virginia Tech, that's one of the things I really, really stress uh, with the students out there, their network of people. Clay Zimmerman, my former student, who was on this webcast, I'll never forget teaching their classes. It was just a great, nice network of uh, young folks that I had going through at those classes at that time. And again, uh, one of the things is, yeah, they competed against each other, but also they complemented each other and have maintained lifelong relationships. And then never equate your self-worth to your net worth. Uh, it's only one of the pillars to a success. Uh, I had an email, nasty email this summer uh, by a, a consultant saying I was discounting uh, the importance of the balance sheet. No. Uh, it's only one of the pillars for success. There's many other aspects of life. Well, it's 45 minutes after the hour. And again, uh, it's been a pleasure. I had three objectives. Number one, I wanted to take you up 30,000 foot, get you out of your silos and get you thinking a little bit broader today. Talked about the management mindset, some of the key components there. Now we're moving into the third aspect and uh, that is engagement. So Scott, uh, hopefully uh, uh, we had some folks uh, put in some questions and I appreciate the big attendance on this today. Humbled with that. And we'll see if we can answer some of the questions that you have out there. So Scott, I'm turning it back over to you as I get a drink of water here. All right, thank you, Dave. Before we get started answering questions, we'd like to share a brief video and then we'll be right back to answer the questions submitted during today's presentation. Five cents might not seem like much, but when it's five cents for every cow every day, then it really adds up. New AminoSure XM Precision Release Methionine provides the optimal combination of cost, feed stability, rumen stability, and intestinal release to deliver the best cost per unit of available methionine on the market today. Learn how at balchemanh.com slash findyourx. All right, as a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane on the attendee control panel. Uh, Dr. Cole, your first question uh, comes in from Rodrigo. Um, do you have any advice for developing effective advisory teams for dairy farms? Yes, uh, and matter of fact, uh, one of the things that I have found, I've worked very closely with Dr. Danny Kleinfelder. He teaches the Ag Management School down at Texas A&M, and I've been involved with that for 30 years. And uh, one of the things that I, there's four or five things you gotta consider. Uh, you've gotta have specific goals, actions, and outcomes. And uh, one of the things, this is where some of your KPIs and some of those aspects are in there. Some of the things that can be monitored. The second thing is team synergy. Uh, oftentimes you'll have the nutritionist, the crop uh, consultant, you'll have the lender in there. And one of the things that I find is uh, good advisory teams get outside of their silos. I get after my lenders because uh, oftentimes they're just thinking the financials. You, you got to listen to the nutritionist or you got to listen to the uh, crop person. And so that team synergy and keeping those meetings, you know, two hours, uh, two to three hours now with Zoom, 
uh, I really see this uh, expanding uh, out there, and, and sometimes you can bring team synergy from around the globe uh, right to the doorstep. Uh, the other thing is uh, to have effective advisory team is the dairy uh, producing producer team has to have the human horsepower. And oftentimes, uh, sometimes it's just driven by one individual. Oftentimes the team synergy is very, very important to analyze. And one of the things that you will find is an advisory team can be fired at any time. And you know, you're gonna ask tough questions. And if you're not threatened to be fired two or three times, you're probably not doing your job. And so those are some of the things that I really look at. And the other thing, doing cost benefit analysis of some of those recommendations. You know, that last video was so important because as Dr. Danny Kleinfeller says, uh, you know, success in a business, not doing one thing a thousand percent better, it's doing a thousand little things one percent better. And, and this is the key is the real good managers, they're looking for that incremental uh, type of uh, aspect. And then the final thing is, will the managers, will the owners uh, implement, <clears throat> you know, uh, the advice out there. So those, that was a long answer to a short question, but boy, that's one of the fastest trends to mark more progressive dairies. Scott, back to you. Yep. Uh, our next question comes in from Thomas. Can you comment on as greater disparities of income of our population driving the ability of them to purchase food, i.e. Uh, uh, I lost it here, i.e. Um, <laughs> Are we seeing huge lines for people in food banks, et cetera? Yeah, okay. You, you are seeing uh, bigger lines, you know, in the food banks. Uh, but one of the other things is I'm also seeing this uh, consumer uh, really kind of uh, more aware of transparency, where the food's produced, how it's processed, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so, we are starting to see some of this disparity in income. Uh, it's, and it's happening throughout the world. Uh, but uh, one of the things that we really found was when the shelves went empty here and around the world, people started really appreciating food. Uh, you know, one of the, Scott, one of the biggest trends we're seeing here in the States, uh, to some extent up into Canada, is local processing. And uh, one of the things is uh, processing or regional type of processing and the consumer uh, is definitely putting the food with the face, et cetera, et cetera. And this is one of the positive trends uh, that has really come out uh, of this whole COVID uh, type of situation. So yeah, there's lines at the food bank. There are, there's always going to be line, lines at the food bank. Uh, but one of the things is we have not seen uh, you know, major shortages for an extended period of time. Scott? Okay, we've got an interesting question come, coming in from Gideon. Climate change is expected to affect agriculture, especially in developing countries. How do you see the innovation assisting in this aspect of feeding the world? Uh, climate change is going to be really important. I, and I, again, I'm not a climatologist, meteorologist, I'm an economist, but I'm on with this Eric Snodgrass guy. He'd be a good one to uh, do a video cast for you. And for example, uh, for all you folks that are on from Canada, you know, as I was telling the Canadian group here last week, I did a webcast up there, soybeans were not, you know, prominently grown in Canada, but because of climate change, it's one of the biggest crops that are out there. And so one of the things that you're really going to see is we're going to have to uh, uh, put in uh, into our management IQ uh, this whole aspect of climate and weather change. Because again, whether you're trying to get cows bred or you know changing nutrition, et cetera, et cetera, uh, where that dairy is located and in the climate or the climate around that, or if they're getting their inputs uh, from other areas of the world, it's going to be very, very important. Matter of fact, I recommend any young person, uh, Scott, uh, to take a course or two in meteorology, but don't take the course, take the professor, because there's a lot of professors you wouldn't even want to take a course from, okay? I, I'm just being blunt. But I really see this climate change really impacting, uh, you know, some of the 
uh, developing nations out here, et cetera, et cetera, because we're getting extremes uh, in those areas of the world. And particularly a number of those areas are located in the Southern hemisphere of the world. So, you know, the weather change, the climate change, it, it's out there and it is gonna be in extremes. And uh, again, that's coming back to soil health and water health. Uh, uh, it's gonna be kind of a holistic type of package uh, uh, that uh, we're gonna do, you know, be out there, but emerging nations will be at risk uh, no doubt about it. All right, thank you for that. Uh, Matt is asking, the black swan event in the dairy was the 2008 stock market that led into 2009, but after it led to the best five years in dairy prices in my lifetime. What are your thoughts coming out of 2020? Okay, take 2008, 2009, excellent question. That hit just a certain segment of society. It melted down real estate, mel melted down equity markets. And so, and, and here was the other thing. In 2008, 2009, we were still in the midst of a commodity super cycle. In other words, China, emerging nations were upgrading their diet. So the demand was there to carry the demand. Let's fast forward to this pandemic, Scott. This pandemic, what's happened is it hit everybody in the world. In other words, you couldn't escape. Uh, uh, this bug. And so what's happening is this pandemic or this black swan is much more widespread. And while we had a cure uh, for the 2008-2009, it was basically central banks around the world coming to the rescue. Over, we don't quite have a cure yet. And we aren't quite certain if another uh, spinoff of this bug is going to occur. So this is why you're probably not going to see the post-2009 uh, impact to the dairy industry going out 21 to 25, 2021 to 25. And again, much more widespread. Uh, and again, we're uncertain of uh, what, when we're gonna get the cure and the extent of the cures, Scott. Very, very good question. Matter of fact, uh, that question there uh, is being asked more and more out there. Changing direction just a little bit, you talked a little bit about Bioshock. So that, that's a new term to me. Um, can you explain a little bit more about what, what, what Bioshocks are? Yeah, Scott, uh, for example, we had H1N1. We had SARS, uh, Ebola, and then we had this thing called COVID. Now, you think about COVID, see, we've had four Bioshocks since, uh, and, you know, some that we don't even know since the year 2000, but they were basically confined. This one uh, got out. And if you think about it, how did it get out? Let's go back to 1970, that's back in my decades. Uh, 370 million people worldwide traveled via air. Last year, 2.2 billion. And so what happened was this bug was able to get out of the can and be spread worldwide. And so the others were mini bioshocks. This was a major bioshock. And so, you know, Scott, I could see out in the future where uh, disease control centers uh, measure it on a one to 10 scale, where the H1N1 and, you know, SARS might have been a, a three. Uh, this one is definitely a nine or a 10. And so that's the example of the bioshocks. And this one hit most every country in the world, uh, some nations harder than others. Uh, but uh, uh, again, this is what made this one more of an eight, nine, or a 10, rather than a one, two, or three. All right, thank you for that, uh, that, that helps a lot. Uh, Charles is asking, you mentioned the importance of a person's network. Understand and agree with the importance. What are some practical approaches you suggest to developing your network and the variety of things to consider? That's a really good question. In other words, a network of people. Uh, for example, I, I'm a big believer of these conferences when we get back to face-to-face -to -face, uh, uh, developing. Oftentimes you go to the conference and you network with uh, people and you pick up ideas and you exchange. And what's beautiful about today's environment, uh, via technology, Zoom, you can continue uh, to be able to do that. Uh, if you have youngsters out there, 
uh, one of the things is uh, not everybody has to go to university or college to be successful vocational and technical school, but it's the young people that they associate with. You know, another uh, thing that I think is going to be important is being able to interact with the consumer or the public out here. Uh, you know, being able to get input, et cetera, et cetera. But I got to tell you another thing in this under, uh, uh, in this type of environment, I asked a Canadian group last week on a webcast, uh, you know, what's what's been the downside of COVID-19? 22% said social uh, isolation, you know, family, others out there. And you have to be really careful in these emotional type of environments is to, you know, make sure you just don't get uh, uh, too isolated. So I find that through education, through some of our conferences, uh, you know, advisory teams out here, this is a good way to build your network. And can I tell you another trend that's starting to occur in the dairy industry and other industries, it's where you have peer advisors. Uh, in other words, other people look at the, your nutrition programs, you know, other, other dairymen or they might look at your financials, et cetera, et cetera. And that's been invaluable uh, to form that type of uh, network. That's one of the things I learned in basketball and basketball coaching is uh, the whole thing of contacts and networks. Uh, and, and again, you're either gonna have people elevate you or pull you down and that'll be your choice. Very, very good question. Scott, we're getting some good questions. Yeah, excellent questions today. We have a very bright audience. Um, Martha is asking, uh, please elaborate on the non-dairy, non-meat alternatives. Do you really think uh, there are that much competition? Well, I'll tell you what, Martha, uh, one of the things is uh, you would say, well, they aren't going to be a major part of the market, but say they're even five to 10 percent, uh, you know, that's that's big. And here's what they're doing. McDonald's came out with a McPlant meal. Uh, one of the pizza chains came out with a sausage uh, plant burger. Uh, you're seeing it in dairy, Alicia, my associate here, she just found something where uh, they're putting together ingredients to re replace milk. And look, at, there's a lot of venture capital behind this. Second, they're using AI, artificial intelligence. And one of the things is, think about it as nutritionists out here. What they're doing is putting a package together for human health, what they consider, quote, is human health. We as a dairy industry have got to do the same thing uh, with our consumer out there. And you know what the other thing is? They're utilizing technology. In other words, you can get pickup. Uh, you don't have to go in the stores, et cetera, et cetera. And with the urban public, two generations away from the farm, whether it's here in the U.S., or Canada, or over in Europe, uh, or down in Australia and New Zealand, it just leaves an avenue for them to come in. And you know what they say? They're saving the environment. So uh, again, they've got a lot of money. They know how to use technology. Uh, they are putting uh, what I call a total package together. Uh, this is going to be a force. And you know, rather than the dairy fighting with each other, well, one of the things that we're going to have to do is kind of get our thinking caps on. We got a great product out here. Uh, let's uh, you know. Uh, uh, bestow the attributes out there. Very, very good question from Martha. Yeah, very good question. Very good answer. Uh, we're just past the top of the hour, Dr. Cole. Do you have uh, time for a couple more questions? Yep. Two more questions and then we'll, I don't want to go over my welcome here. Okay, Clay Zimmerman knew that I always ended class on time, started on time as well. Go for it, Scott. All right. Um, what are the best sources of economic information for non-economists? You know, I, I got to tell you, uh, I, I like a lot of the dairy magazines that are published here or even globally, uh, because oftentimes they will have some good economic articles, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, if you are a non-economist out there, a uh, magazine I, I read very, very closely is The Economist magazine. It, it gives you that global view. And, and hey, folks, I don't care what your point of view is. Sometimes you got to hear the other side and, you know, kind of be an open mind. And I had a Ladies tell me the other day for the eagle to fly, you know, the left wing and the right wing have to work together. And that's the way I look at it. And also I'll read the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal. Uh, but 
what I like to do, and I want you to be thinking about it, you got three buckets. You know, you got your, your dairy type of magazines that you could get it from, or ag magazines. Then you got the big picture economists, Wall Street Journal, et cetera, et cetera. But then your third bucket is kind of the local or regional. There are some good writers out there. So those are the three buckets that uh, I would recommend that you get from. And I, I read about two hours a day. That's how I kind of uh, keep up with uh, things around the world. So I think the final question here is a good one to end on. What advice do you have for young people looking forward to working in the dairy industry? I'll tell you what, I was over at Virginia Tech Dairy uh, Senior Management class, and boy, what a great bunch of young students uh, that were there. A couple of things I recommend is, one, make sure they have internships nationally and internationally. One internship, you know, uh, in your country, but one internationally, because it's going to be a global uh, world. And and the thing is, make sure they get a little bit of business, get a little bit of bio, and get communications. And communications is just not speaking. It's nonverbal communication. It's listening skills. Uh, so that, you know, human interface, and we're going to be doing it more and more via technology. Uh, I also see... Um, uh, I try, as I mentioned to him, get out of your silo. Uh, I had one young lady, she was going to be a nutritious, great young lady. Uh, and I've been lecturing two or three times. I finally got her excited about finance. She says, you know, this stuff's pretty neat. I see how my advice and nutrition applies over here to the economics and the finance and getting them out of their silos, very important. But I am a big believer degrees are obsolete. I think we're going to have a series of certificates. Uh, why can't we take the courses from the best professors in the world? Uh, you all know, don't have to go to university. It could be vocational and technical school. And I see the blended education approach. Take some online, but then you do face-to-face, -face, uh, what I call intense uh, series. I know that Virginia Tech used to, and Cornell used to uh, take worldwide travel events after COVID. Maybe we can do that. Those would be some of the elements that, initially would help develop that network that I talked about earlier. And I'm a big believer, uh, uh, you know, after lecturing over here at Virginia Tech, there's some really, really uh, uh, good young people out there. And they have a bright future in the dairy industry and also the agriculture industry. Scott, I've gone over time. It's been a pleasure to be with you today. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Cole. And, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. If you have additional questions, please submit them to anh.marketing at valchem.com and we'll forward them to you along with the unanswered questions from today's session. Remember, you can receive one ARPAS credit for today's webinar. Our certificate of participation is also available to download in the handouts tab on your control panel. Don't miss Valchem's new podcast series. The Real Science Exchange is an extension of the Real Science Lecture Series where you'll get to know top researchers like you've never known them before. Go behind the scenes and hear the conversations that take place over a few drinks with friends. Search for Real Science Exchange in your favorite podcast platform. The next Real Science Lecture Series webinar will be next week on December 8th, as we continue to ask what 2021 has in store for us. Brett Stewart with Global Agritrends will review the global mega uh, trends in agriculture. Visit valchemanh.com slash real science for more details and to register. On behalf of Valchem and Dr. Cole, thank you for joining us today.